Mark is a visiting assistant professor in communication at the University of Pittsburgh and a scholar in residence uh, here in the uh, College of Liberal Arts at Duquesne. And uh, I, I smile when I say visiting uh, assistant professor because he's got a number of books and uh, his level of scholarship and what he's accomplished is, is, is uh, uh, clearly, full professor, so whatever one would want to make of it. Uh, it may include Consumption in Everyday Life uh, with Routledge in 2005, and then a couple of other books that touch on the theme for today, The Senses of Touch, Haptics, Affects, and Technologies with Berg, 2007. And he's co-edited a, a volume, Touching Space, Placing Touch with Ashkate in 2012, and uh, one that's in press uh, already uh, is seen with uh, the Hands, Blindness and Philosophy after Descartes and Diderot. Um, the, 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 he's done a, a number of articles, and just to give you an, an idea of the interdisciplinarity of these articles, there's one uh, that uh, concerns the area of robot skin, uh, so robot skin, and then another with the pre, uh, covers uh, issues like prehistoric textiles and linking this, uh, those up to touch and the idea of haptic modeling. So quite a, a diverse range of topics that, that he's dealing with. And then the talk that he's giving today is based on a new book, his next book project, How We, Be How we Became Sensory Motor, A History of the Muscle Sense. And so uh, now he, he can, uh, so I'm going to welcome Mark. Uh, thank you so much, Fred. Uh, I really have to say thank you for you all for visiting here. It's a rainy end of yeah, term kind of uh, experience. Um, we're probably zombified from teaching and various other things. Thank you very much also to Fred because <coughs> I have been to some of the Seeker talks before and they've been fascinating. And insofar as my teaching timetable can, can fit, um, I want to come along and I really hope that next semester I can, I can turn up because there's been some great stuff. Uh, I've enjoyed what I've seen. So um, yeah, uh, I think kind of as a workshop, this will kind of work. I'm going to talk for probably about 40, 43 minutes, probably about that. And it's not timed or anything, so I'm just guessing. Um, and it's kind of quite broad and historical, so it's kind of warm and fuzzy. It, it'll be not too challenging, which is great for kind of um, Thursday afternoon. It's getting dark and so on, so it's not too challenging. But I think there are some things that I want to kind of, uh, I've given some of this research in different talks. So at a communication conference quite recently, and then a few weeks ago at a literature, science, and the arts conference too. But for different audiences, it's been kind of tailored differently. And that kind of historical core is something that I want to play with here, because it does pertain to some of the uh, phenomenological work on the body and the, the motoric body, basically. So uh, there are some kind of touch points with Meliponti, as we'll find out. I've got another version of this paper. Well, it's not this paper, actually. I've got another paper, let's, let's put it that way, that I gave, actually, at the communication conference, which was about Revaison. So a kind of um, the habit body and repetition and the role of movement within the habit body as well. So, you know, together, they might lead to something, or they might not. So let's see. The other kind of thing to preface this talk, uh, lots of preparatory comments, but uh, this originally turns into a, a chapter for this book, uh, Touching and Being Touched, which was a, a kind of uh, a workshop in Berlin, uh, with which just just published just a few weeks ago, actually, with uh, De Goita. And there's kind of quite surprising people who weren't there at the <coughs> workshop, actually. Erin uh, Manning has a chapter in there, and Brian Masumi has a chapter in there as well. So there are, there are some chapters worth checking out, not just mine. <laughs> so, um, it, and that chapter has a kind of similar title to here. So I'm going to offer uh, kind of highlights of an ongoing research project uh, here on the history of neurophysiology that informed our contemporary understanding of somatic sensations of muscular movement, or in other words, how our bodies became sensory motor. So early psychology and neurophysiology has trouble differentiating somatic sensations that lie outside the Aristotelian five-sense model. And I could talk, I'm not going to today, but the, the role of aesthesis in this 
uh, with the anima and the sensuit sensibilibus is very much uh, a kind of five-fold classification model of the senses. And I think by looking at kind of this expanded notion of touch, and I think with Daniel Heller Rosen and his book, uh, which is called Inner Touch, An Archaeology of, of Sensation, I don't know whether you know that at all. It's kind of quite a literary, philosophical exploration of these kind of things from, it's kind of interesting, but it's not very scholarly, but it's kind of interesting. And it's kind of written with a kind of experimental way. Um, and some of the kind of material that he's looked at has been uh, going back to Aristotle, but also looking at other figures in early modern culture too, uh, to expand this notion of the five sense model. Uh, especially kind of the idea of co-anesthesia. There's a chapter in there on co-anesthesia, which I'll mention a little bit later on. So J.S. Mill, describing work by neurologists on the so-called muscle sense that Bell in 1833 had identified and Bain in 1855 developed, acknowledged what he says, the paradox of feelings which are not felt. And he writes that in 1896. This talk offers a kind of historical snapshot and a kind of beginning of a spatial narrative, and I'll say more about that later, a kind of cartography, in di differentiating between those feelings which are not felt, uh, which prompts us to question the nature of the sensory modalities. You know, what is a sense modality? And I think this has been looked at recently in philosophy, especially uh, Fiona McPherson uh, on the sense and the modalities. There's also a volume, an upcoming volume which I've written uh, a chapter with my wife, uh, on exactly this, this area as well, on the modalities. And the indeterminability of sensations that lie outside the biologically determined Aristotelian model of the five uh, senses. So uh, it might also involve a historical cartographic investigation into determining and identifying the source of motor impulses. So in part, it's a kind of journey, you know, like the early explorers of the same kind of time period, actually not dissimilar time period, that kind of going back to the source, thinking about this part of the brain that deals with sensory input and motor output. So kind of finding the source of the Nile, finding the sensory motor cortex type of thing. I think a future version of this paper, you know, when I develop this, this research, I think it'll explore more that kind of cartographic, cartographic metaphor. So let's go back to Aristotle. Uh, and let's imagine ourselves walking the warm, gentle sunshine far away from here and now. <laughs> the last time you and I walked any distance up an incline, we both felt an ache in our mid-thighs. Our explanations centered around increasing age, perhaps, a build-up of lactic acid, muscles that are not used uh, to that kind of movement habitually, and so on. And then our minds and our bodies moved on. In a book attributed to Aristotle, Problems, amongst a series of musings and questions on processes of digestion and the effects of the south winds on behavior, uh, he also considers walking. And he says, why is it that in ascending a slope, our knees feel the strain and in descending the thighs? Is it because when we ascend, we throw the body upwards and the jerk of the body from the knees is considerable? and so we feel the strain in the knees, but in going downhill, because the weight is carried by the legs, we are supported by our thighs, and so they feel the strain. And he keeps on going back, uh, getting diverted, other tangents, and then going back to this. And so in later explanations, he refines the question. He attempts to localize the sensations, arguing that the greatest pressure is felt at the center of the moving thing. And consequently, that proximity to to body heat and excretory processes intensifies the sensation. In other words, Aristotle is seeking an explanation for why thighs feel strain and feel fatigue because of certain spatial relationships with respect to the human body and its environment. This spatial mechanism, a kind of cartographic imagination of, of bodily sensations with a center and a periphery, is indissociably connected with muscular movement and will be deployed once again in 1907, in a famous essay by neurologist Charles Bell that maps out what he calls the proprioceptive system. And we'll come back to that landmark essay later on. For now, we note the import of that Aristotelian question. For back around 350 BCE, P. 
people evidently felt the same aches, they noticed coincidences of movement and muscular sensations of fatigue, but had little notion of the intertwining of the nervous system and musculature, nor even of a spatially separated motor cortex. As Maxine Sheets Johnson has written, she says, in short, what has changed in 2,300 years is not the body and our experience of it, but ways in which we conceive it. There are going to be some animals in this talk. It's going to be a frog, well, several frogs actually, and a cat. But we'll start off with Sherrington's frog. Uh, in his landmark essay on the proprioceptive proprietor system in the journal Brain in 1907, he makes the simple spatial distinction of a surface field of an organism and the deep field constituted by the tissues of the organism. where the former is outer-directed or exteroceptive, in his words, and the latter is more internally directed or interoceptive. His seemingly straightforward spatial logic is initially helpful as he proceeds to describe the difference between receptors on an organism's surface as opposed to the proprioceptors, the receptors of the deep field. But as the essay proceeds, this division between surface and depth, inner and outer, starts to become less layered and more literally labyrinthine. Take frog one. Okay, so there are two frogs, I said. This is frog one. Uh, this is in his essay. Um, there are a couple of dissections of frogs, or descriptions of dissections. Um, luckily, not too many diagrams. Although, in looking at kind of images to use, I've seen some quite visceral photographs of frog dissections, which I can't quite forget <laughs> right now. If you remove the cerebral hemispheres, it maintains not only its muscle tonus, but also its orientation, Sherrington found. If you flip it over, it autocorrects its posture. The system of proprioception and posture of the animal as a whole is what he's describing here. So proprioceptors, those receptors that deal with proprioception, obviously, are distributed throughout the body, unlike touch. So when I've written about touch, uh, you know, usually we think of the cutaneous sense of touch as touch on the skin, which are, is actually pressure, so mechanoreceptors, and sometimes temperature, so when you feel the burning, so thermoreceptors, and pain, uh, nociceptors. But the proprioceptors are that feeling of the position of the muscles and so on, in the deep field. So, although proprioceptors are distributed throughout the body, there's a part of the brain which coordinates the total body posture and its orientation to the environment. Body segments and head segments are coordinated through a different part of the brain and another spatial metaphor, it turns out, the labyrinth. This is where the semicircular canals and the otolith that we know is part of the vestibular system of balance is housed. Now, in humans, we know this from diagrams because of the... Uh, the seashell type of thing, the snail type mechanism of the... But in frogs, it's obviously much, much smaller. Uh, and these, these semicircular canals are fed data from the periphery of the body. So remove the labyrinth of the frog, Sherrington says, and the frog body collapses completely. So unlike previously, where it was able to correct itself, even without the cerebellum, if you remove the labyrinth, uh, it collapses completely like the blow of a boxer will collapse his opponent in a heap on the floor. Okay. So from Sherrington, we are going to discuss some 19th century and early 20th century neurophysiologists to think of the body, the whole body, as an organ of sense. So the paradox of trying to empirically observe and measure those spatially distributed feelings which are not felt, this section. Between Aristotle and 19th, 19th century physiologists like Bastian and Bell, Condiac and his followers describe a so-called active touch, which predates Gibson's 20th century same use of the phrase. But attention to the particularity of what is sensed through the muscular body becomes of scientific interest in Germany 
as the muscle sin or muscle sense, which is distinguished from the tas sin or sense of touch, by George Benhart and others. Similar terminology was first introduced into Britain as early as 1820 by Thomas Brown in his uh, lectures on the philosophy of the human mind, where he talks about uh, an awareness of muscular contraction, so kind of general feeling. But the new body of research was then reported to the British scientific com community by Sir William Hamilton, writing in 1846, and subsequently William Hammond in 1871 provides an abbreviated report of the German uh, physiologist George's 1870 paper in a section entitled The Muscular Sense, Muskelsen, in the Journal of Psychological Medicine. So this portmanteau word, Muskelsen, uh, persisted in both Britain and Germany, involving later uses such as Schaefer in 1889, Hochheisen in 1893 on the sense for the blind, and Goldscheider in 1898. So Muskelsen, yes, Muskelsen, uh, is conceptualized as something distinct from cutaneous touch or tassin, or generalized bodily, bodily feeling, gefühlsin, as Kirchner had termed it, or common sense, gemeinempfindungen. I apologize to anybody who speaks German, and I apologize to the whole German nation. <laughs> Just anyway, but especially for my pronunciation. Uh, so gemeinempfindungen for Grund, as Titchener reminds us. In Brown's 1850 lectures, on touch, for example, the sensations particular to muscle, muscle sense are recognizably distinct and worthy of attention. And this is what he says. Uh, I'm not in the way, am I? Okay. Um, the feeling of resistance is to be ascribed not to our organ of touch, tessin, but to our muscular frame as forming a distinct organ of sense. The sensations of this class are commonly so obscure as to be scarcely heeded, but there's no con contraction even of a single muscle which is not attended with some faint degree of sensation that distinguishes it from the contraction of other muscles or from other degrees of contraction of the same muscle. His focus on a form of sensation which is distinctly muscular in origin, yet actually imprecise and vague, is retained, so that shortly afterwards he states, each motion of the limb, whether produced by one or more of the muscles, is accompanied with a certain feeling, which we distinguish from every other feeling accompanying every other quantity of contraction. In other words, a more general awareness of bodily position is maintained through more localized and distinct muscular tensions and contractions. In line with his forebears, this is interpreted as a form of bodily touch that extends beyond the cutaneous and proposes the whole body as an organ of sense, where, quote, our muscular frame is not merely a part of the living machinery of motion, but it's also truly an organ of sense, end quote. In this way, Brown, George, Wundt, and their contemporaries could be considered as re-articulating the ongoing inner touch of the Arist Aristotelian concept of aesthesis, while focusing on its manifestations through muscle fibers and the muscular frame. The particular tensions and contractions that comprise the muscle sin become foregrounded in the absence of other sensory stimuli, especially sight. Attention to the muscular skeletal frame of the body albeit perhaps with the potential for amplified acoustic acuity and resonances, is heightened in the case of blindness, as Hochstein's Hoch Uber den Muskelsinn by blind Blinden, one of the muscle sense of the blind, evidences in 1893. Not long afterwards, Murray's 1909 essay, Organic Sensation, provides an historical overview of what she collectively describes as the sensory contributions from the internal tissues. Reviewing neurophysiological work from the 19th century onwards, she remarks upon, uh, quote, the least developed and systematized sphere of our consciousness, end quote, in order to throw new light on processes of localization and attention, she says. So digestive, muscular, and respiratory systems each produce their own sensations. What Ebbinghaus in 1902 terms, uh, again, um, the German, uh, Sorry, I think there's an asterisk missing from my thing. Okay, I apologize. Eigenartige Empfindungen, or strange sensations. I love this. Strange sensations. In fact, uh, maybe I should retitle this. Strange sensations. Again, Maumann, in a 1907 article on the sensibility of the internal organs, celebrates a multiplicity of organic sensations, or uh, inner 
Tust and Findinger, derived from the distributed organs and tissues, but actually a direct translation of Maumann's phrase would offer the now familiar inner touch sensations. Inner uh, Tust and Findinger. The unusual combination of qualitative diversity yet indistinctness of these sensations together obscures the uh, indefiniteness of localization of the sensations and, says Murray, their deficiency in correlated visual images by which qualitative isolation might be facilitated. End quote. In other words, these sensations remain vague and unsystematic and cannot be compared to the kind of clarity that vision or other modalities enjoys. At the end of one section, Murray summarizes this indistinctness in rather frustrating terms. She says the uh, fusibility, absence of memory images, unanalyzability, lack of cohesiveness, all this kind of negative terminology with other sensations, unlocalizability, uh, capacity for eluding the attention, this kind of usual thing that the philosophers haven't really engaged with, modalities like touch so much, actually, is because of this ephemerality and vagueness as well. And other features ascribed guardedly or confidently in various quarters to our organic, organic experience demand critical ver verification. We must get this right, she says. Well, she doesn't say that, but I, that's my point. The terminological difficulties noted by Murray extend to the laboratory, of course, as that legacy of Wundt's common sensation, Gemeinempfindung, amongst experimental psychologists interested in internal or, as Murray puts it, organic sensations, is problematic. The common element across these sensations seems to be the pain pressure temperature equipment, common in his belief, Wundt's belief, uh, to the exterior and interior of the body alike. Meanwhile, Luciani's volume on the physiology of the sense organs of 1917 acknowledges allied frustration since many of the bodily feelings thus classified escape physiological analysis, he says, owing to their vague and obscure character. So from Wundt's Geneim Empfindung to Henley's Gemeingefühl, compensation or co-anesthesia, I told you that it would come up, this is likewise the sum, the confused chaos of the sensations, which are instantly transmitted to the brain from all parts of the body. Weber, in Der Tastsinn, the sense of touch, and Gemeingefühl, in Common Sense, 1905, identifies possibilities within the chaos of sensation for the body to provide sensory resonances that accompany complex sensory impressions, such as encountering variously localized pain sensations or, say, a combination of colors. Again, this diffuse yet almost synesthetic model assumes an almost contact-like model of the senses, not dissimilar from uh, when Aristotle is talking about aloiosis as the alteration of the sensory faculty eyes thesis uh, in De Anima, for example. We make another jump. So we had frogs. We're going to have cats in the future. We've had uh, walking and legs and mid-thighs and now the hand. So uh, against that kind of background where we're talking about this terminological battleground to do with kind of vagueness and trying to get critical consistency and verification, this starts to emerge. So uh, a more refined answer that distinguishes a distinct muscular sense occurs in Charles Bell's book, uh, The Hand, Its Mechanism and Vital Endowments as Evincing Design where he considers the interaction between touch and movement. In his earlier lectures on anatomy proffered a distinct muscle sense, in his words, a, quote, consciousness of muscular exertion, end quote, akin to a sixth sense. His earlier anatomical discoveries reported the Royal Society of distinct specialized sensory and motor nerves had led him to investigate the mechanisms of the nervous system that governed and regulated muscular activity. Given that we customarily have a sense of muscular coordination, and the awareness that heightens with exertions and spasms, or even the estimation of weights to the use of our hands, Bell states his goal thus. I shall first inquire, if it be necessary, to the governance of the muscular frame, that there be a consciousness of the state or degree of action, 
of the muscles. This can be asked since we are, he says, we are sensible of the most minute changes of muscular exertion, by which we know the position of the body and limbs when there is no other means of knowledge open to us. So we kind of know this, there can be verification uh, and so on. In passing, he offers the example of a rope dancer or a blind man balancing his body, finding an explanation in neuroanatomical terms. In referring to prior discussion of the interactions of sensory and motor nerves, he summarizes in deceptively straightforward language that between the brain and the muscles, he says, there is a circle of nerves. So this is a kind of bidirectional nervous mechanism that he identifies. One nerve, he says, conveys the influence from the brain to the muscle. Another gives the sense of the condition of the muscle to the brain. So likewise, this bidirectional mechanism is referred to in the later book, so the lectures and then the later book. He says there's a nerve of sensibility to convey a sensation of the condition of the muscles to the sensorium, as well as a nerve of motion for conveying the mandate of the will to the muscles. Uh, so it's sensory input, motor output through the will. Uh, conceptualized, therefore, as a circuit of sense in the nervous system and muscular skeletal movement, the body from this moment could well be considered as sensory motor. Uh, the new modality of neuromuscular feedback was later termed proprioception by Sherrington, as we said before, based on his laboratory research conducted on muscular reflexes between 1892 and 1894. Sherrington integrated these experimental observations into a prestigious lecture series at Yale, and this was published as a series of, sorry, this was published as a book much later as the integrative action of the nervous system in 1906. In a centenary appreciation of Sherrington's book, Burke notes how Sherrington identified afferent feedback or nerve impulses returning to the brain from diffuse muscle, muscle tissue. And in the third lecture, Sherrington considered how these afferents were proprioceptive because they're caused by the organism's own movements, in contrast with exteroceptive afferents that convey, convey more distal information from the environment. In lecture nine, Sherrington steps back from the details in order to offer a more panoramic view of the evolutionary development of nervous systems through the phylogenetic sequence. And the implication is that for a range of anatomically sophisticated or kind of higher animals, the sensory is invariably coupled with the motor, so sensory motor. He notes that He notes that by its branching, the motor neuron obtains hold of many muscle fibers. And this diffusion of nerve endings through, yeah, through muscle fibers feeds back to a ganglion within the cerebellum, what Little and Sherrington will later term the motor unit. And this allows Dewey, in his famous essay, The Reflect Arc, Arc Concept in Psychology of 1890, 1896, to speak of sensory motor coordination. Uh, we might think of this in an almost proto phenomenological way because it unites that initial sensory act or stimulus, say, visually noticing an object or person with an associated movement to achieve an overall action. For example, steering a car around a raccoon or waving to a friend. And the reason why I said steering a car around a raccoon is because I've done quite a lot of driving and car trips conferences in the past semester, and the amount of dead animals on the roadside is just heartbreaking, right? All that kind of wasted life and biomass because of SUVs and trucks and things. We don't have so many dead animals on the side of the road in Britain, just a few squirrels. <laughs> So here, I think, is where it, it, it kind of gets kind of interesting, actually, uh, or more interesting, with the waving to a friend or swir swir a car around a raccoon, or what have you. Uh, he says, Dewey says, in uh, examining some of this kind of literature, we begin not with a sensory stimulus, but with a sensory motor coordination. In a certain sense, 
It's the movement which is primary and the sensation which is secondary. The movement of body, head, and eye muscles deter determining the quality of what is experienced. Now, I, I've got a few more things to say about that because I think it goes off in very interesting directions and I think you can help me with those directions. I want to take a kind of more kind of zoom in time to update some of this research into the 1980s. So I know it's kind of historically not exactly continuous, but uh, there is some continuities. There are some continuities as well as the afferent pathways especially through kind of touch, but also problematizing touch as a modality. So I think, yeah. So on the one hand, we can go back to Aristotle then, in terms of where we started this talk with the walking up an incline and the feeling of the muscles and so on. So expressed in more contemporary neurophysiological terms from original research by Mensa and Stanker in 1983, the afferent pathway for the sensory motor body involves, they say, small afferents <coughs> arising in the muscle and joints, consisting of small, unmyelated nerve fibers which arise within the muscle. Now, actually, they're talking about a cat. In their first published research, they're talking about a cat, and they're identifying nerve fibers, which haven't really, their use hasn't really been um, explained before. So these kind of unexplained nerve fibers, which are unmyelated, so unsheathed. Now, touch, especially that kind of mechanoreception, reception is fast. Okay? So you feel something pretty fast. Right? So when somebody kind of brushes against you, maybe it takes you a while to kind of process this, but actually uh, the speed of transmission is relatively fast. But what we're talking about here is actually something which is unsheathed the kind of nerve fibers which are unsheathed, so unmyelated, which is a low threshold touch. Because the last section of this talk, I'm going to be talking about what this low threshold touch is and how it kind of feeds back into what we talked about before, because I think some of this has a new neural explanation, perhaps, which was part of that horrible terminological battleground before. So it, it might help, it might not. We'll see. <coughs> So, whereas Sherrington had talked about the frog, and here Mense and Stanka start their research with the cat, a cat, some cats, and then with some humans afterwards. So, just like we did at the beginning of this talk, when considering walking with Aristotle, Mense and Stanka pondered whether these afferents or low level feedback reach consciousness and what perception they might produce, since the system could signal not just fatigue or pain, but also pleasure. So this is one of the things about movement and dancing and walking with Aristotle that isn't just about pain, there's also some kind of pleasure involved as well. Such low threshold touch as research by Alausen more recently after Mincy and Stanka. So Alausen and his colleagues has subsequently revealed involves these unmyelated CT fibers, which, unlike conventional touch through large myelinated fibers, is not localized or clearly perceived, yet occurs in the same brain area, the insular cortex, as the monitoring functions of internal bodily sensations, sorry, functions like hunger, pain, and discomfort. In other words, this low threshold touch is continually present as part of the sensations of having a body, or Sheraton's proprioception. Now, perhaps also, we might argue, part of the schema corporeal, uh, the body schema. Um, and just as a kind of aside, um, there are kind of parallels with the other paper that I gave about the bison, uh, where he talks of that there's no purely passive sensation and that motility plays a part. So, the says in 1838, which is kind of um, the previous section, contemporary with the previous section, he says, in every sensation, Motility and perception have a role. I quite like that phrase. But low threshold touch is also capable of producing pleasure from, this is what Mensa and Stanker find, from gentle caressing or stroking in a way that registers differently from 
high threshold cutaneous touch per se. So the argument is that you know, if somebody brushes past you or you touch something and you have this active touch, or what have, what have you, it's a different <coughs> qualitative feeling than maybe a caress, perhaps, or a loving touch. And we're going to follow that in terms of movement as well. So maybe uh, you know, what this might do in terms of the pleasures of movement too. too. So it supports the mixed sensations that Bell had described in another section of The Hand, his book The Hand, which he, this section is entitled The Pleasures Arising from the Muscular Sense. An example of that he gives is redolent of our beginning walking with Aristotle example as well. And he says in this section, the exercise of the muscular frame is the source of some of our chief enjoyments. The beautiful condition of both body and mind shall result from muscular exertion and the alternations of activity and bodily repose. This activity is followed by weariness and a desire for rest, and although unattended by any describable pleasure or local sensation, there is diffused throughout every part of the frame, after fatigue, a feeling almost voluptuous. I love that. I love that. So, in proprioceiving, if we can use this word, some people do, uh, in proprioceiving, a difference between a static body state at one point in time and anticipating the, possibly, the possibility of future movement in that body, Bell touches upon a kinesthetic element in describing this muscle sense to the effect that touching of any kind involves a proprioceptive component, the sense of one's own body, particularly when movement is involved. He says, quote, we could not command our muscles in standing, far less in walking, leaping, or running, had we not a perception of the condition of the muscles previous to the exercise of the will, he says. Touching, especially through the prehensile organ of the hand, also betrays a kinesthetic element, since it is the combined perception of touch with movement of the hands, arms, and fingers that are necessary to embrace objects in the active register necessary for an engaged sense of touch. And in asserting this, Bell anticipates, or perhaps acknowledges, Weber's slightly later 1834 psychophysical experiments on so-called active touch, which are recounted in Der Tassin, on the sense of touch. And this is Weber speaking. So it is affirmed by physiologists that the sense of touch differs from the other senses by this circumstance, that an effort is propagated towards it, as well as a sensation received from it. This confusion obviously arises from considering the muscular agency, which is directed by the will during the exercise of touch, as belonging to the nerve of touch properly. We proceed to show how the sense of motion and that of touch are necessarily combined. It's Weber speaking. So this observation, tying in a somatic active tactility to the principle of movement, again expands tactility from mere cutaneous contact and by invoking the idea of a kind of muscular agency, uh, we might consider it a, a kind of more active or prehensile inhabitation of the body, an enlivened form of tactility. And it would go back to what uh, Hella Rosen speaks of as that kind of form of inner touch, which is still alive, despite the fact that the terminology kind of shifts. And we might consider, for example, a choreographer tentatively sketching movements for a dance piece or how a painter approaches a blank canvas with maybe a series of broad brush strokes in mind, successively accreting further movements and gestures with paint, and so sympathetically feeling the textures inscribed. Um, the last thing I want to say, really, is, uh, before I finish and open up, is that um, one other section I could have added, but we're running out of time, but one other section I could have added was some research recently by Jonathan Cole, the neuroscientist, Jonathan Cole, and Barbara Montero. And Barbara Montero has been looking at dance, and so she's kind of philosopher of dance, and she's published on this. And one of her articles was uh, from 2006, Proprioception as an Aesthetic Sense. And it's kind of interesting to try to kind of think about how you know, the sense of the body in the movement, and the dancer's body, could be considered as a kind of aesthetic 
entity or quality in its own right. And also writing, her writing with Jonathan Cole as well, um, Affective Proprioception is the name of their article when they write together for an article in Jenna's head where they talk about some of this kind of low threshold touch as well and the kind of the pleasures of the moving body. So um, I'll leave you with that thought of the pleasures of the moving body. Thank you. Lots of time for questions, discussion, explorations, and again, there is there is drink and food uh, to to whoever wishes it. So, anybody, uh, we can start with questions. Well, thank you very much. I thought it was um, <coughs> really fascinating. Um, uh, I suppose uh, I w I'd like to hear more about the more general project that this is a part of. You know, uh, uh, are you sort of arguing with anyone in terms of uh, are you proposing? Something different from a, from a from a consensus somewhere about about this uh, this collection, this historical collection of sources, and this uh, very extraordinarily rich uh, series of reflections on, on touch and, and scent. Um, but and this may be a complete line out. But um, what, one thing that I noticed, or one parallel that I noticed, that, uh, you quoted from um, J. S. Mill talking about. Uh, the paradox of feelings that are not felt, which is a very striking phrase, and it puts me immediately in mind of Freud. Um, you know, as early as 1895, Freud was writing um, the project for a scientific psychology, um, and in other words, even prior to when he sort of fully took the leap into a, sort of a more speculative psychoanalytic account, um, he was very fascinated by this problem, the idea that people seem to have physical uh, uh, sensations which uh, were unexplainable by any sort of organic uh, uh, reasoning uh, and which uh, were hidden to them in some way and yet were somehow connected nonetheless, not simply, uh, that is to say, as feelings or sensations, but somehow also connected to meaning, some kind of unconscious meaning which was then written on the body in a certain way. And so, you know, when, when Freud then writes about the first uh, his, hysterical uh, patients that he saw, hysterical paralysis is the the condition that he was especially concerned with. He writes about um, the idea of a kind of um, an, an imposition on the body of an unconscious meaning that is then expressed as sensation within, within a sort of corporeal uh, uh, process. And anyway, I mean, so that was just a connection that immediately jumped out at me. And obviously that the, um, the scientific paradigm within which this history is being um, Constructed is, is essentially a neuro, neurophysiological one, and I wonder if, that, if there is potential for conversations beyond that. Just that. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. No. Brilliant. Okay, that's what I was hoping for actually, because I can only really profess my absolute ignorance uh, in terms of Freud's writing. I know that's because I could have excuses. I guess I have my communication department, but actually, this would be kind of very. I, I could have to look into this. Um, I was in all the in all the sources I've been looking at. There hasn't actually been any substantive citation of this. Mm -hmm. It is kind of quite remarkable. So, if what you're saying is true, and I have no doubt that that is the case, um, then I think this could be actually a very very useful historical parallel. Right. The only, the only thing is, I mean, I think you've also hit upon a kind of uh, so the project. If I just outline a little bit more of the project, you can yeah. see where where I've come from and where I'm going to. So on the one hand, um, there is, isn't a distinct argument apart from in the latter part of the book. So it's in two parts. The first part is purely historical. So this, this is why one of the reasons why I'm trying to draw very different threads together. So having more threads is kind of always good, but having too many threads is not so good. Sure. But this might be a very useful thread. Okay, so absolutely. Um, but one of the things is that, you know, Maybe a project that Daniel Heller Rosen was trying to do in a more quirky literary manner was try to uh, kind of give an overview or a snapshot of different writings and different uh, literary engagements with people like, for example, um, Main de Baron on the one hand, but also uh, some. Uh, I think there's some Neoplatonists too. It's historically all over the place, but it's kind of cut up so they're kind of different strands that he's following. And each chapter is written in a different style. 
and so on. So, you know, with great respect to his kind of methodological experimentation and, and so on, there are those kind of historical threads that I'd like to tie, like the whole notion of a synapse, actually, is, again, like from the Greek, is kind of putting bundles together. And I think there is a virtue in the historical part of this book in putting some of those historical threads together and you know, showing the proximity of some, some of these concepts. But in the later part of the book, actually, is more about um, uh, what this might mean for you know, its take up in other areas of uh, social thought in terms of thinking about gestures and movement and the possibility of, um, well, its uptake in the performing arts as well. So there are certain movements within modernism about maybe notation, experimental notation about movement, uh, those kind of projects about, uh, you know, how do we, how can we think movement otherwise? How we can, can we incorporate movement with other senses and other projects too? So I think it's still historical, but maybe it's a bit more of that second part. But there are some, maybe it opens out that, those kind of discussions. Uh, so I'm going to have to look at this for it uh, in more detail, this particular writing. Thank you. Yeah, that sounds, sounds absolutely fascinating. Thanks. Um, what you, you, in, in the summary you gave of this, in, in uh, the abstract, you mentioned you're, you're wanting to achieve this unified map. Uh, 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 that's way you put it in the abstract. And the idea, I guess, of linking the, the external sensations that we have with the kinesthetic feelings we have within the body and the order of responses. And what I was wondering is how, in terms of unified map, if, if we put this in a, in a larger framework and see what happens. And I'm thinking of Erwin Strauss's book, The Upright Posture. And uh, the easiest way to put it is, imagine we're all standing up right now. Why the heck don't we just collapse? Why is that? Uh, there, there's several, you can give, I think, a, a fair mechanistic explanation of why not. But another is to say, well, the body's never by itself anyhow. Intrinsically, it's already related to its surroundings. It's an interaction, an opening onto its surroundings. So you can't start with the, sort of break apart the body and the environment around it. You have to take that as a whole and then talk about the particular way that unfolds. So the body stand, stays upright because it's always directed towards something. Think of those days when we finish the semester after we've done all the work. That's usually when we get sick because we've been held up all semester long by all the preparation we have to do, the lectures we have to give, and then when it all comes to an end, we just sort of want to collapse, unless we're lucky enough to find something else to draw us back in the world, and uh, you know, like the things we do on vacation. So a lot of times, if, if we take this larger place for this this uh, unified map that you mentioned, uh, how does that fit in with this more? particular way of, 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 of linking sensations up with uh, external uh, stimuli and with motor responses. Could that be a part that's left out? To, to some degree, it, it almost has to be left out of a framework that wants to divide things into independent variables and, and dependent variables, which is typically our, our experimental uh, framework. And so we're, we're asking, if is there a large, and, and, and there's some good reasons for leaving that out a lot, because we learn a lot that medical science and whatnot to some degree is based on it. But it maybe doesn't give us the full story uh, that this more or less uh, Strauss I mentioned, Merle Ponty, would come in here. But you can also say Deleuze and Guattari, not phenomenologists, but they use a lot of phenomenology to set up their system. And I'm just wondering you know, what your reflections are on that and how that goes with this idea of unified map. Thank you. Yeah. Um, well, is it too late to take back? The sessions that I'm making an abstract. Yes. This is allowed. I mean, it sounds weirdly overambitious. I mean, what was I thinking? I was stressed or something. But uh, I mean, uh, thank you for that point about stress. Actually, it's kind of interesting because I did actually refer to that exact book, The Upright Posture, in the other presentation on Rebison. So I'm sorry that that's actually kind of, that's kind of bad. That's actually kind of bad manners of me uh, to constantly refer to that other thing because it's not this thing. But uh, I, I didn't have time to look at that in significant detail. But I think there is something here about like an orientation to the environment, but also, yeah, which is an organism's, which is kind of suggested by the frog and so on. I think, I think also, um, the question of kind of qualitative engagement with a series of sensations which are also kind of in that battleground of terminology. 
And I think this is another possible thing that I could have done actually today, is explain more the legacy of where, where I've been coming from in terms of I was a human geographer before I became, well, I was a philosopher, then a human geographer, and then a communication person. And in my human geography department, uh, one of the things that I was kind of fascinated by was people doing field work. You know, I just couldn't quite, you know, being a philosopher, I couldn't quite imagine how you go into the field and suddenly that's where the research is. I mean, wow. And so as I started to kind of um, explore more uh, ethnography and then read more about kind of sensory ethnography, there came some kind of realization that actually nobody's really written about this. Uh, uh, human geography has got a bit of a problem with phenomenology. It actively detests phenomenology. It had a brief love affair, but now won't even look it in the eye. And the brief love affair happened in the 1980s with humanistic geography. It was called humanistic geography. And so people like David Seaman and, and Butterman and so on, and the kind of dance, place dance ballets. Place, yeah, the ballets, uh, you know, place movement ballets. Um, you know, fantastic stuff. But since then, it's been completely excised almost. It's kind of almost embarrassing. So uh, part of what I thought I could maybe add to was some of the literature that's coming in terms of sensory ethnography. And so I was fascinated by what Catherine Lynn Gertz is doing in Ghana, isn't it? Catherine Lynn Gertz. The Enlo Iwe people of Western Ghana. Yeah. yeah. And what she did was she did what proper ethnographers do, which is to be there for years. You know, like I don't think that happens really much these days. Not enough, anyway. Um, and she wrote this monograph. And it was all about, basically, the link between the language, learning the language, and moving like an analog Iwe person. So she noticed that quite a lot of the idioms, the idiomatic expressions, involved ideas about good movement and bad movement. And there was a kind of positivity and negativity kind of attached. So there's kind of an ethics to this too. And when she's writing about this, she has to do this through rich description, because this is what ethnography is. And so I thought that was a kind of entry point to thinking about maybe these kind of, um, the vagueness of these sensations, the um, their kind of ephemerality, is not just a problem for you know, what Murray was talking about earlier on, and the need for kind of critical verification. It's not just a problem in terms of philosophy because of you know its complete lack of engagement with you know the senses until quite recently, properly, apart from you know obviously ocular centrism or whatever. But a kind of revisitation to senses and bodily sensations like Ganson and Ganson have been writing about like everyday bodily sensations and so on. But also in terms of ethnography, having to write these things into being, having to feel them and write them at the same time. So how do you write about the moving body? And this was a, a thing that really motivated me, and I wrote uh, an article about this for a geography journal, um, a kind of a guide to field work. I can't do field work. I've never done field work. So it was like, well, uh, at least I can offer something along the lines of you know, how you might do this in, in the wild, as it were. Um, and uh, you know, obviously kind of teaching students about this. Sorry, this is a very long rambling answer to your question. But I think there is something here, actually, about the identification, the acknowledgement, and the writing of the, these sensations into being through rich description, which could be potentially really, really, really useful. Because I haven't seen enough ethnography that deals with this, these kind of sensations in these kinds of ways. Um, and that would work as a kind of critical re-examination of the body and its relationship to the environment in the same way that perhaps, or well not the same way, but in a parallel way to perhaps how Strauss is looking at it as well. It's kind of orientation to, of a motor organism towards its environment and so on. And then the individual sensation, yeah. Can I follow up with one comment? Sure. It also pulls in a little I can try to run away from it. But it's not because I detest them. I, perhaps I love them too much, and I need to escape and get into other other uh, 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 modes that don't always go through. I mentioned, but the idea of a vague sensation, a vague feeling, is something Merleau-Ponty always talks about. Ambiguity as a positive phenomenon, meaning that 
usually we think of, the, of vagueness as kind of a mistake. You know, if I looked a little closely, I'd get rid of the vagueness and I'd find the exact uh, uh, sensations behind the vagueness. And uh, there, there was a reductionist view of the vagueness. Whereas I, I got the idea from me what you're saying is, well, we don't want to reduce the vagueness. The vagueness is a positive phenomenon. It really exists as vague. And if you try to make it specific in the way that we like to think of uh, in Newtonian science, let's say it's punctate uh, particles making everything and punctate feelings, you know, we'd lose that phenomenon. And the real problem then is how do we take that vagueness and fit it in with this map that it gets a kind of unity without sacrificing the vagueness? Because the old map was you reduce the vagueness to punctate sensations, and one sort of the other, get your mechanistic map and go that way. And it sounds to me like you're looking for something else, some other way, other, other way of keeping it, without reducing it. And is that fair? Yes, but it highlights an absolute paradox within this whole kind of project, which I do acknowledge and have acknowledged uh, in the formation of this project, but which is kind of ripe for remarking upon at this moment, which is that on the one hand, like you, I didn't want to go too heavily into Melaponti territory because it's going to seduce me and I'm going to be sucked down into it so far and I'm going to love it. And I think one of the next phases of what I want to write actually is you know, with a recent translation by Landers, uh, and so this kind of this this retranslation of the of motility to motricity, and whether there's something there about maybe a more active agency movement, or whether actually it's it's a, an active undergoing, or what have you. I, I still have yet to kind of work it out. And this maybe there are people in this room, perhaps Jessica, for example, that maybe could help me work this out too. But it's yet you know, I've yet to um, work it up. Uh, but in terms of the map as well, so the map, uh, on the one hand there's a c comfortable map, the neurological map, the labyrinth. But the thing about the labyrinth is that, uh, you know, you get lost on the way, so it seems to have the promise of absolute spatial certainty, mm -hmm. but at the same time, you know, there's disor disorientation along the way. And I think one of the things that I'd like to bring up in developing this work further is this kind of metaphor of cartography to go back to the idea that actually, well, we kind of know that, that this is the territory, but actually we don't know at the same time. So maybe that vagueness and the acknowledgement of the vagueness of the sensation uh, can work as a kind of counterpoint to this impulse, this kind of almost colonial cartographic expansion into other territories and this neurological, sorry, that sounds very pat and or even glib or something, but, but maybe it works, maybe it doesn't. Um, so the certainty at the, at the heart of this, the uncertainty and the vagueness. And it's, it's, I'm always struck by the scientific imagination, you know, imagining this kind of cartography of, of the body and stuff. And, you know, you and I have talked about uh, Destin and Gallison's work, you know, objectivity and their, their use of scientific uh, imaging. Yeah. And those, I think we talked about this. We didn't? <laughs> we talked about imagination. Um, but anyway, I, it, what it led me, I mean, the images are striking. The, the, the mapping of the frog's body, and I'm sure the cat is equally riveting, you know. Um, and I'm just wondering if, if that kind of, if that dimension of these texts and the readings that you're doing going all the way back plays a role in how, you know, you're, what you're looking into, you know, how the scientific imagination is imagining a cartography. Yes, absolutely, okay. absolutely. I mean, I think that's that's pretty much the main impulse that I've been working with. It's kind of it's almost like an aesthetic response mm -hmm. to these um, diagrams, these kind of nerve yeah. diagrams, which are kind of circuit diagrams. If we think of, you know, there's a, a an ex colleague of mine who's written about the London Underground, the the tube and the tube map, and the tube map arising as a direct result of the rise of cybernetics in society, and so this is kind of it's almost like a circuit, as in electric circuit, and so on. This kind of scientific imagination, this kind of planning imagine, imaginary of it, you know, kind of because the tube map isn't like that, as we know, it's not these kind of circles and things like that. Um, so yeah, I think I think you've hit upon something which is absolutely right. This by me looking at various diagrams of uh, Vesalius and uh, Leonardo da Vinci of the body and just being absolutely fascinated by them. These, the cutaways and the, uh, 
that kind of incredible rich detail, but also these these kind of um, there are plenty of diagrams in Sherrington's books, for example, um, and Bell's The Hand too. Uh, that actually there is this um, lithographic splaying out of a spatial imaginary and this playing out of, an, of a spatial imaginary and where they are then which m might actually kind of be the impetus behind them finding the centre you know uh, where does that come from? Where, where's that notion of the circuit or the centre of the periphery come from apart from maybe this kind of elementary cartographic imagination as well and uh, I, I don't know much about uh, human geography that's maybe why I'm no longer a human geographer <laughs> But there's something actually about the aesthetics of maps, which is completely actually about maps of power, and you know, we now have in our on our computers the ability to uh, use a vast amount of data to portray the maps that we want to see. Whereas actually in the past, it would it was far more narrow. The bottleneck actually was, you know, partly information, but partly you know, how do you depict? Yeah, yeah. So I think you're right. I think there, that aesthetics is necessary component to work this. It's, uh, I mean, if you're not familiar with their work, uh, Peter Gallus and Lorraine Daston, and they published a book called Objectivity, which is about the intersection of the aesthetic with scientific imaging and imagination. And they've done a lot of other stuff uh, along the same lines, but it's, it's, it sounds like it's very much up your alley. Thank you. Thank you. Justin and? Uh, Peter Daston, D-A-S-T-O-N, and we did. We did. So, so, so my question is: We've been talking a lot about uh, in, in the question and answer session how uh, muscles moving body relate to ideas of agency and the phenomenon of approaching the world. Um, and I'm curious if you know of anyone or if you yourself have given any thought to the different ways in which training the muscle can change the amount of, say, agency you can enact upon the world or the approach you give to it. And it just sort of occurred to me as I was listening to you that, for example, like strength training or strength uh, training or building muscles, you're really trying to work on contracting the muscles versus gymnastics, the persistence, trying to hold it in certain positions for long periods of time or sports. You practice certain movements on a regular basis. And it really does change how you approach the world, at least in my experience with you know, weightlifters. They tend to approach kind of everything as though it's something to be lifted up. I mean, it sounds very weird to <laughs> say, but um, you know, it, it, it really does change the way you experience the world. So I'm curious if you have any thoughts on, on the way in which training muscles, uh, using this model of, of that as a type of sensation, um, sort of yields a different world, or changes the amount of agency or alters the approach you take upon the world. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, yes. And I think that will be the logical consequence, pretty much, mm -hmm. of what I understand so far from my reading, is that uh, this will be in the kind of second part. So uh, away from the kind of historical neurological findings and neurophysiological findings, but maybe Think about well, what kind of spaces are disclosed through, you know, repetitive movement and activity. Uh, this is something that Ravison talks about a great deal. Actually, is this kind of notion of well, repetition is never of the same, which is what you know going back to Deleuze. Actually, what Deleuze picks up um, and so on that there is something new. Uh, that actually the habit body and maybe the training of a muscle or a series of muscles and a way of actually disclosing a slightly different world. Uh, as a result, I think that is absolutely, that is what I would like to look at. So I think you've hit upon something. Mm -hmm. As to um, whether or not, so for example, going back to ethnography, uh, capo, capo, the martial art that comes from capoeira, Brazil, capoeira, capoeira, capoeira. yeah, capoeira. Um, so there is an Australian anthropologist who's written about this, and he undergoes the training, just like Louis Roquant with boxing. Um, this is actually through capoeira, and so obviously movement and fluidity, and the training of certain muscles in order to allow particular fluidities of movement, 
Um, I don't know much about capoeira, apart from just reading that book. <laughs> but um, certainly, I think that that's something which, uh, in the next part, is something that I would like to follow up. Partly because in dance, and certain, you know, because clearly there's something about dance here as well. And the unspoken thing about dance, but we can say about gymnastics and physical activity, because I'm not a sports person at all. Uh, I just don't get sports. And, but I do understand that training, and I speak to people who do train, and I've, in fact, I've met you a couple of times actually, Jim, the few times I've ever been to a gym. And, uh, you know, it, it's kind of, uh, yes, um, but obviously with capoeira, it's a way of um, trying to enhance. A movement space and help disclose a movement space and ex explore that kind of fluidity. Now, if that's the case, then he's writing about and he's kind of um, reflexively writing about how these new movements can come into being and so on in a way that I couldn't because being in a gym, maybe I just feel a bit stronger and maybe like parkour people, they look at buildings in a very different way, especially around this campus. There's lots of things to maybe run up against, or if you play. Assassin's Creed video game, then suddenly you look at ledges and think, oh, I could climb up. Oh, no, I can't because actually I don't have that athletic ability. I certainly don't have that athletic ability. But yes, I, I think more, more seriously, the, the, the training, that, that absolute materiality of the muscular repetition and the building, and building of capacity and the building of muscular tissue, and then that sense of the fluidity is something that absolutely is there in dance as well. And so I think when I'm talking about uh, notation and forms of notation, what I also want to do is think about interesting ethnographies of movement and dance and how this might, so I don't want to, I get this. I think the link there would be to build up the idea of, the idea of rep repetition and movement and muscularity without actually having to do this myself because I don't particularly want to do it myself. Yeah. So I think you're right. This was actually uh, something I was wondering about in terms of dance. I, I, I really don't know much about dance, but I was thinking about the relationship between dance as an art form and how we experience it as an audience, uh, how it moves us in some way. And I, to me, there seems to be a sort of problem that you know, just as you're saying, dance is a practice. There is a practice associated with it. And that voluptuousness, which Carol is talking about, seems to be associated with a physical practice. And I can see how in music, for example, we have an audience and we're listening, but we are following along, we're following along in time. And music is an art of the temporal, and it's shaping the time. And we are engaging in that simultaneously with the performer. And so we are involved and we are sort of part of that practice to a certain extent when we're listening to a piece of music. But in dance, I don't know the extent to which the audience is a part of that practice or can ever be. And I, I just wondered um, how you saw that because you mentioned at one point the caress. And to me that seemed very different from the rest of your talk when you were dealing with the, the, the sort of proprioceptive sense, it's very different from the expressive sense, which you located in the caress. And so I, I wondered how the expressivity of dance works, because it seems to me that dance is very often has to be translated purely into the visual for the audience. And we, we had a talk, speaking of everybody trying to escape me on a but we had a talk <laughs> at that conference that was kind of interesting. Uh, I don't know if you caught it or not, but a, a woman from Brazil who oh, yes, did some work yeah. with blind people who are not dancers, but dancing. And it, it seemed almost, you know, it seemed ridiculous at first. But who were these blind people dancing? And But, it, you know, it was beautiful to see their movements and their experience of dance, which is often a visual art in, in many ways, but they had to experience it from the inside. So I, I didn't know if you could talk a little bit about these modalities of how we are as an audience experiencing dance. Um, is there a way to sort of get closer to what the suggestion was here? Yes, okay. Thank you very much for answering. Uh, I was getting that question because um, it is absolutely crucial, actually, and it is something that I haven't mentioned so far. But one of the, I'm going to go back to almost the beginning. Yeah, so this book, um, the the 
workshop in Berlin, the University of Berlin, was for a project on uh, empathy and dance. Mm -hmm. okay. And there were some neuroscientists there. Uh, there are always neuroscientists now, apparently, that appear everywhere like mushrooms. And one of the big projects that one of the um, D. Reynolds, who is a, she's um, a choreographer and dancer and professor of dance in England, and she had a very very large HRC-based project, so kind of you know, uh, arts humanities related council project, called Watching Dance kinesthetic empathy and something else. Mm -hmm. And so she was one of the kind of uh, big speakers here. And I was kind of quite bowled over by how much Susan Leigh Foster's book, and this actually is something that I should have answered to you as well, apart from just the kind of repetitive practice of building a muscle, is actually that uh, there is this other, like Susan Leigh Foster, uh, her book, Choreographing Empathy. Uh, which came out a couple of years ago, actually, 2011, I think it was. And uh, really what we're identifying here is this kind of large sub-movement within dance. Suddenly, quite a lot of people are looking at this thing called, that they call kinesthetic empathy, for want of a better word, which is exactly what happens when you see somebody else dance. And that is purely what they're interested in. So you've hit, hit upon the nub of the issue here in terms of not only what's it like for me to do the dance, and for me to build up muscle capacity and then to write about it and to reflect upon it. But also, what's it like for somebody to watch me? Heaven help them. Yeah, for me, does. But, yeah. Um, now, with uh, this idea of kind of kinesthetic empathy, the, the kind of default then would be to kind of look at mirror neurons mm -hmm. and the usual kind of stuff, visuality and so on. And, you know, th that's clearly a thing that's not going to go away. And it's kind of quite interesting. But I don't, I'm not sure how much the neuroscience actually does support the kind of things that we're trying to build up here. Because on the one hand, if we only danced for other people to see, literally to see with their eyes, then it would render the blind dances that the, the preceding moment, but also one of my um, PhD students actually in, in Britain, in the geography department, his PhD research was on uh, blind choreography. So he, in kind of shopping centres and malls around the UK, uh, he got a bunch of blind and severely vision impaired dancers and a choreographer to um, improvise and to come up with a piece that they then went out and performed places. And you could ask the same question to them, what are you doing, why would this be important? Because of the pleasure of the sensation, but also because when you watch this, you also kind of have, uh, whether you're a dancer or not, there is still some pleasure in seeing the movement of others. And maybe some of the neuroscience behind, some, maybe some of the potentially questionable neuroscience, but some of the neuroscience nevertheless behind some of the people presenting in Berlin was exactly what happens when you put somebody in a, into an MRI scanner, of course, um, and see movement. So, and of course, if you're a dancer, similar regions light up, apparently. So, you know, scientifically, it's proven that, you know, we respond, if we're dancers, we respond more to other dancers. But if we're not dancers, we still respond to dance, clearly. And if we're responding to blind people dancing, we're actually responding to movement. But maybe we're also um, taking pleasure in their pleasure, too. I'm not sure. But I think there's some very interesting, knotty issues here, actually, about Again, the validation through science and the notion of, kind of scientific imagery that, uh, you know, this kinesthetic empathy, is this actually a thing or is it actually something which we need to be a thing because actually otherwise dance is mostly visual and there are no explanatory mechanisms? Or is kinesthetic empathy actually something that we all have because we all know what it's like to walk and to dance? And even if we dance badly, it doesn't stop us from taking pleasure in watching people dance well. That type of thing. So yes, mm -hmm. and I think the second part of the book, Kerry Noland actually, uh, her book on gesture and performance has some kind of reflection on this. She takes up some of this kind of literature and she also has a sequence in which she looks at a graffiti artist and the kind of repetitive movement of a graffiti artist. And of course, when you're doing tagging, 
it is all about the repetition. You want the same tag again and again and again in different places and more adventurous places again. And then you become more uh, proficient. And it's actually about getting a flow as well and seeing the city in a slightly different way um, as part of a bit of a landscape of flow and your bodily movement and getting away from the police is a different type of flow as well. <laughs> so yes. It's funny the thing flows. Uh, if you're working uh, with another person, and you're handing things back and forth. There might you might say there's a kinesthetic uh, empathy there, but it, 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 it revolves around the work that you're doing together. So again, the situation is a bit more than, than the two people involved. Um, but the other thing, I, I kept thinking this notion of the haptic touch. And, uh, Deleuze talks about this in an interesting way, because he says, you know, usually we think haptic is touch, that's what my hand does, and then there's vision, my eyes open up, I can see at the distance. And, and he and a, a number of other thinkers want to say, well, there's a visual as, uh, as uh, there's a way in which vision can also be haptic, where he, he gives an example of a painter who's painting a field. And the painter's looking at the field, but in a sense you might say the, the, the painter is also entering into the field. There's a proximity, even though it's at a distance, and that proximity is a form of, of haptic uh, uh, relationship to something else. And again, it's one of those things that doesn't fit into our, our uh, cartography uh, <clears throat> from, from a strictly, from, from a, a more traditional scientific framework. But yet, it's part of the, car the cartography I think we want to understand the broader sense of the world around us and the relationship to it. And so that idea of the haptic sense that's involved in even in sight is kind of interesting. And that, can, uh, that, that we were talking before about the mixture of the senses in the way. Or even when you enter in a room, like you take the atmosphere in the room right now, you experience that, and it, and it involves in it, in it, your whole body, really. Uh, but it's it's not just seeing in the normal sense something at a distance or touching something close up. It's being involved in, which is its own kind of space, and, and has an, it related to it uh, this, the movements that uh, fit that space and help constitute it at the same time. And going off of that, when you were talking about the map, I kept thinking the old idea of the mental map, the idea that, well, and it fits in cognitive theory a lot, that if I want to uh, uh, have a unified uh, uh, map of my body, then I, I, uh, I calculate where different things are in the relationships between them, and that's a mental activity, as opposed to a pure uh, uh, bodily sense of uh, the different parts of the body, where the different parts of my body are. How, how much of that map that you're after is, are you thinking of as a cognitive construction? If I'm following, so there's a few pieces yeah. here. I'm not sure where I, I fully grasp okay. what, what, what you're doing is. So I love all the pieces I'm seeing there. But I, <laughs> yeah, OK. Um, again, this, th there's two things I'd like to say about this. First, first of all, the haptic. Um, so my PhD thesis was actually haptic spaces. That's just two words, haptic spaces. And it's based on page 433 of A Thousand Petals, where <laughs> that's exactly where that happens, uh -huh. that discussion of the haptic and the optic, because of Riegel, so the German art historian Riegel. And so, you know, it, the visual performs a non-optical function, they say. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, so, yes. And I think uh, there is, uh, again, this thing about, well, it's vision, uh, even Descartes in Diotrique, actually, when he's explaining the mechanisms of vision and the diagram of the eye, mm -hmm. there is also famously a picture of the blind man with a stick, because he likens you know, seeing to like a blind man with a stick feeling his way. So it's almost like there's a haptic explanation at the heart of this kind of mechanical optics. Thing. So I think that's kind of quite, quite a nice idea. Uh, back to the map. The maps are troubling you, and they're troubling me. And I'm glad that we could be mutually troubled by this. But I think, I mean, the story will go like this, but it could change. Um, if, on the one hand, we're dealing with this uncertainty at the heart of certainty, and this kind of notion of the labyrinth, then on the one hand, what we're doing with a mental map is exactly the thing of the notion of, like, an imperative for certainty, that kind of intention towards certainty and just in the same way that with a tube map or what have you or a circuit diagram or 
the nervous system, for example. But of course, those kind of vague sensations of where you feel your feet at a particular time. I mean, when I explain to my students what proprioception is, I say, well, just imagine all the lights have gone off. It's completely dark. You can't see anything in front of you, not even you know, your hand in front of your face. But you still know if you're sitting upright, if you're sitting down, where your legs are in space. It's a bit vague, but you still know. Mm -hmm. And you know whether your arms are stretched out. And the only people who don't know are weird aberrations. People that have had neurological disease. It's very, very rare indeed because of Cole's, Jonathan Cole's book, Pride in a Daily Marathon, where there's that uh, figure who gets an infection. Um, so we kind of know it when we, when it's not, well, we don't know when it's not there because it's not there but we, we kind of recognize it when it happens. But again, it's kind of very difficult to kind of pin down and so on. So maybe it's actually about the transition between these two maps. Mm -hmm. The first part, the historical map, which is that kind of the imperative towards certainty, and the second part of the book, that notion of freeing up the map and exploring the uncertainty at the heart of this and the vagueness and celebrating the vagueness of these sensations as well. But that vagueness of sensations is clearly there historically. It's clearly there in terms of Know, an inner touch, uh, or co-anesthesia, um, which is the, the sense of all the senses together, and so on. Or, you know, the uh, reactivating the old Aristotelian idea of the common senses as well, um, aesthesis koine, which is explicitly referred to by the Germans, um, Gemein Gefu. Yeah, so I don't know, I'm not sure yet. One thing that struck me, that there's two ways of dealing with this map. There, there's the one you just mentioned, when, when there's a disease of some sort on the map, so it literally falls apart, or mm. it goes into fragments before it gets reconstructed in a new way. And then there's the way where we try to break it in art, and in, other, in, in our thinking often, too. It may make sense what you're trying to do right here, and talking about a new kind of map to break the other one so that you can get at another one. There's sort of a positive and a negative, you might say, way in which those maps uh, uh, get uh, 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 trying to how do you destroy a map? You rip it apart. You can, <laughs> there must be some better metaphor, though. But anyhow, the map, screw it up. Turn it around. <laughs> it's a map to nowhere. Fold in on itself. A map, yeah. a map to somewhere versus a map to somewhere to entirely new. Mm. Like the psychogeographers. Yeah. Yeah. Like the psychogeographers. The cut and paste. Uh -huh. idea of they took a city map for the wrong city and decided uh -huh. to follow the wrong city map <laughs> deliberately on purpose uh -huh. to, f to get themselves lost this notion of the derive uh, you know, a kind of long walk through the city to get uh -huh. lost to actually uh -huh. kind of find the city again right. Right? Yeah. so again the celebration of vagueness and uncertainty yeah, yeah I, I like this idea and also, by the way, we've, we've gone off our temporal map. It's 10 after. We usually end at 6, but what we generally say is people can continue in conversation. Nathan and I sort of clean up a bit. We also clean up by trying to consume some of these nice things. <laughs> we're still trying to entice you all to have a little more wine or something so we can justify the <laughs> putting it there. So we keep putting it there. Uh, I'm kidding. I don't want to force anybody. <laughs> but anyhow, so we, we can continue on a more informal way now that the official time's done and uh, consume what's there or leave it. And, um, and uh, yeah, that's generally the way we end. Nice. Well, thank you.